Hey there, everybody, and a happy good morning to you. Uh, this is John Barba with Dave Holdorf. Uh, we're from Takeo Comfort Solutions, and we're going to talk about zone valves and circulators in just a couple of minutes. It's uh, about two minutes until the official start time. So uh, we just wanted to get this thing started just a little bit ahead and say hello, how are you? And uh, just kind of kibitz for a couple of minutes before the actual presentation begins. We see a lot of folks out there, got 14, 14 of you plus two of us. Uh, I think we had about 31 pre-registered, so that's pretty cool. Um, so I see a couple familiar names out there. I see I see Jackie Stevenson. Hi, Jackie. Jackie. Uh, Jim, Jackie. Jim Todd. Ken Scannell. How you doing, everybody? Michaela. How are you? Good to see you. Tim Ward. Uh, don't you? Don't we get enough of each other, Tim? <laughs> I'm glad you're here. Uh, uh, good to see everybody. Um, and uh, I. I Kind of different way of doing uh, doing a trade show. How are you guys liking it so far? I'm kind of interested to hear your your uh, your take on it all. Uh, it's virtual. Is virtual are virtual trade shows kind of the way we're going to go? I'm not really so sure. Um, but any chance we get to spend together to me is is a good is a good thing. So I'm glad we we're, I'm glad you're all here, and I'm glad we're going to get to spend the next hour together talking about one of my favorite subjects, which is better zone valves or circulators. Let's get this show started. Uh, I, I, on your on your control panel, you should see a little orange arrow. And if that orange arrow is pointing to the left, please click on that, and it, that'll kind of explode your uh, your um, your control panel. And then down at the bottom, there'll be a thing called chat and questions, and that's where you're going to type in your questions. And we, have, Dave and I, both want to hear your questions. We'd love to know what what's on your mind. What makes sense? What doesn't? Uh, you know, please feel free. Any question that comes to mind, please, please do so. I'm also going to ask you guys some questions, and that's the area where you, I want, I'd like you to type in your answers. And the first question I have for you is, which is better, zone valves or circulators? So there's 15 of you out there. I, I want to see 15 answers. Which is better, zone valves or circulators, in your opinion? If you were king of the hydronics world, okay, let's look at it this way. If you were king of the hydronics world, and Everybody in hydronics had to do what you said. How would you rule? If you were king or queen, and as the case may be, how would you rule? Which way would we zone? Would we zone with circulators or would we zone with zone valves? And you can't say both or you can't say it depends on the application. You got to pick one or the other. So right now I've got, you know, uh, I've got uh, Jim Todd saying zone valves. Jackie says zone valves. All right, what do the rest of you, what, what do the rest of you folks say? Zone valves or circulators? You get to choose, man. You get to set the way things are going to be done. Okay, Mike Lampkin says zone valves. Clint Crane says zone valves. All right, Michaela says zone valves. Uh, Cody Mack, easy answer, zone valves. All right, interesting, interesting. All right, I, I guess the next question is why. Why are you choosing zone valves? Or if you have not, uh, if you have not chimed in and you're a circulator person, why would you choose circulators? Why choose zone valves? Why choose circulators? So it's going to require a little bit more input on your part. Which you, we, why are you choosing what you're choosing? All right, and we'll wait for your answers because it's important. And as we're waiting, I'll, I, I do want to share with you just a, a, an interesting little story that happened to me. Um, is is years and years ago, um, back when I worked with tools and actually worked for a living, um, I, I used to stop at the, at an FW Web in Fitchburg, Massachusetts, as my kind of my to pick up my daily supplies for that day's work. And I had been on vacation; I hadn't been in in about a week or so. And I came back and I saw a whole bunch of vans parked in front of the front door, like normal, and then a whole bunch of vans parked on the far end of the parking lot, which wasn't normal. And there were a bunch of guys outside those vans talking to each other, looking at the door really crossly, and then looking at their watches and wondering what the heck was going on. And I say, okay, why are these guys over here and not over here? What's going on? So like an idiot, I just walked right in because I didn't know what was going on. Got to the desk, asked the guy at the counter, I says, Dennis, why are these guys waiting outside? What's going on? I never saw that before. He goes, oh, you haven't been in for a while. The guys outside, those are the zone valve guys. The guys in here are the circulator guys. And I looked at him and go, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> and, and he said, we had to separate them. Why? He says, well, about a week ago, we had a huge fist fight. 
apparently one guy lost a boiler, big boiler replacement job to another guy who used zone valves. The guy that lost the job used circulators. And the guy that lost the job was furious. He said, oh, that SOB, blah, 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 blah. He's cheapening everything up. He's ruining the industry. And it's all because of price. And he's not doing it right. He's doing it wrong with zone valves. You should be using circulators. And there was another guy in this in the in the in this in the at the counter said, well, what the heck's wrong with zone valves? And actually, from that point on, it turned into a brawl, honest to God, fist fight to the point where they had to separate the zone valve guys and the circulator guys. On Monday, Wednesday, Friday, the zone valve, the circulator guys got to go first when they left. The, the zone valve guys could come in and order their stuff. And then on Tuesdays and Thursdays, the zone valve guys could go first. The circulator guys had to wait. And then the next week they'd switch. And this went on for several months. Believe it or not, as insane as that sounds, that really did happen because of just the, 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 the tension between the two sides. It's not like that anymore, though. And I think the reason it's not like that anymore has to do with uh, radiant floor heating. How do you zone a radiant floor heating system? Well, with manifold actuators, right? Little actuators on each loop. That's essentially a zone valve system. And that showed the people that, that showed the circulator mafia that zone valves were not the, the you know the spawn of Satan. All right. And then it just kind of got both sides talking and it was detente and everybody was happy again. Now we're seeing a lot of folks here say zone valves, and it's interesting because both sides are very have have very uh, uh, specific arguments uh, on on their side. And in reality, if you're if you're just simply talking about delivering BTUs, all right, keeping people from freezing to death, both are a perfect ten. Nobody's going to know the difference. There's not there's not a person within the sound of my voice on this webinar or anywhere on the World Wide Web, or if I open up the window and shout it out, there's not a person there out there that can walk into a house in the middle of winter and say with any amount of certainty, yeah, that feels like zone valve heat to me. Or that feels like circulator heat to me. There's really no difference. Okay, there's really no difference. Designed and installed properly, there's no difference in terms of delivering BTUs. Now there are differences, of course. In there are there are well, it's not differences. There are advantages and drawbacks to each. All right, and it simply depends on what you're looking for and what your comfort level is. All right, so there's really it, 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 there's really no real difference. So in reality, both paths are the right paths, and it's a take your pick kind of thing. Both are good. Neither's better. Neither's bad. You get you'll get people that'll say, "Yeah, zone valves suck." You get people that'll say, "Yeah, circulators, that's crazy. Why would you do it that way?" Well, as long as you do it right, both work and both work just fine. So let's talk about why zone with circulators. If you're going to zone with circulators, why would you do it? Well, why not, right? Why not zone with circulators? Circulators are pretty doggone reliable. Circulators are pretty doggone redundant, all right? That's the big argument that people that want to zone with circulators, that's the number one argument that you'll get. Well, there's redundancy. Hey, I've got, it, it goes back to first grade math. If Mary had five circulators and Billy took one circulator away, how many circulators does Mary have left? Well, there's four, right? If a circulator dies, I got other circulators, no one's going to freeze to death on my watch. Okay, fair enough. Redundancy is a perfectly legitimate uh, rationale for zoning with circulators. It kind of flies in the face of that reliability thing, but hey, it, it, it is what it is. For the same, I like to, I, just for fun, I like to ask guys to say, well, I do circulators because of redundancy, because if one circulator fails, I got other circulators. I always like to say, well, yeah, that's terrific. Good. Well, how many boilers are you putting in? Oh, just the one? Well, what happens if that boiler fails? And if you think about it, what's more likely to have an issue in a hydronic system? Something in the combustion chain or a circulator? That's an interesting question. I think redundancy is important when it doesn't cost too much. Okay, just, a, just a way of looking at it, just a way of looking at it. That said, if there's a house that's way out in the middle of nowhere and it's a good ways away from your normal service area, hey, you know, redundancy might not be a bad thing for you and for your customer, all right? If there's a customer that maybe maybe this is their, their last home and they just don't want any issues, they want that extra layer of security or whatever, redundancy might not be a bad thing. Just, just again, at that point, it's it depends on the application. But redundancy is legit, I think. Here's the dirty little secret, however, when I when when it comes to zoning with circulators. In most residential hydronic applications, uh, if every zone has its own circulator, 
it's damn near impossible to undersize that circulator for one simple reason. None of the circulator manufacturers out there, whether it's us, Grunfoss, Xylem, BNG, you name it, none of us actually make a circulator that in most cases would in fact be undersized. Nobody, it, it, the, the flow and head requirements, if you actually do the arithmetic to find out what they are, the flow and head requirements are more often than not very, very low it's it's impossible to undersize a circulator, absolutely impossible. That said, three-speed circulators have caused us more problems than they've solved, I think, because when you have a three-speed circulator, where do you set it, right? More often than not, where do we see them set? Low? No, they're not set to low. That's for people. That that's that's the that's the, the that's the preschool speed. That's for children, all right? Medium is there, but nobody uses medium because medium's for people with commitment issues. Everybody puts it to high, also known as contractor no callback mode. So we're taking a circulator that, that could be potentially somewhat oversized and we're making it wicked oversized. <laughs> we'll talk about all that in a little bit. But th that's kind of the dirty little secret. It's hard to undersize a circulator. Let's talk about actually sizing a circulator and see why that undersizing thing is next to impossible. All right. Let's take a gander here. Um, if we're sizing a circulator, you got to do the math, okay? You've got to do the math. Um, you got to know the flow rate. You start with knowing the flow rate. Circulators are sized for gallons per minute flow at certain feet of head, okay? To overcome a certain feet of head. So it's like six gallons a minute at seven feet ahead or four gallons a minute at eight feet ahead. Whatever the math tells us the, 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 the flow and the head loss or pressure loss will be in a given piping circuit. So we got to start off by determining the flow rate. And to, start, to determine the flow rate, we use this specific math formula. We call it the universal hydronics formula. And it states that GPM is equal to BTUH divided by the product of delta T times 500. Let's dive, I, I, I identify the terms. GPM, of course, is gallons per minute. That's the flow rate you need to deliver the BTUs required at a given point in time. BTUH, BTUs per hour, well, that's the heating load at a given point in time. Let's note that that always changes, okay? That always changes. It changes with the weather, or in a zone valve system, it changes with both the weather and the number of zones open and closed at a given point in time. Delta T, that is your designed for temperature drop, the designed for temperature drop of the fluid as it goes through the system, Typical residential hydronics here in North America, we design to a delta T of, let's say, 20. That's kind of the common delta T that we design around. Meaning, if it's a cast iron boiler, the water goes out at 180, 20 degree delta T, it comes back at 160. We have an average water temperature, therefore, of 170. So 180 out, 160 back. That's what we're shooting for. Residential radiant, we might design to a delta T of 10, and that's done for comfort and consistent floor surface temperatures in most cases. Um, so that might be the water might go out at 120, come back at 110 for an average of 115. All right. So that's that's delta T at work. 500 is a mathematical constant. It comes from multiplying the weight of one gallon of water, 8.33 pounds, times the number of minutes in an hour. That's 60 times the specific gravity of the fluid at room temperature, that's one, times the specific heat of the fluid, that's also one. 8.33 times 60 times one times one is 499.8, we'll call it 500. As the water gets warmer, its density goes down and the specific gravity changes. So as the water gets hotter, that 500 is gonna get a little bit lower. But we're, 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 we're gunning for some specifics here, some, some generality. So we're gonna use 500 in this case. So GPM equals BTUH divided by delta T times 500. All righty, so let's do one. Let's do one zone of fin tube baseboard, keep it simple. One zone of fin tube baseboard, and this is gonna be a big honking zone, all right? The actual heating load, not the, not, not the amount of baseboard installed, but the actual B, calculated BTU load for the zone is 30,000 BTU. So that makes it a big honking zone. We're designing, of course, to a 20 degree delta T and we're doing 100% water. So let's fill in the blanks here. So we start filling in the blanks. We have um, 30,000 divided by 20 times 500. Now 20 times 500 is 10,000. So 30,000 divided by 10,000, what 
friends and neighbors, is my required gallons per minute flow rate under design conditions? Well, 30,000 divided by 10,000, of course, is going to be three gallons per minute. So the flow rate this circulator is going to need to deliver for 30,000 BTUs is three GPM. And it has to do that under design conditions. So far, so good. Three gallons per minute. Next, we have to figure out the head loss or the friction loss. Water runs through the pipe, all right? There's friction. It hits a, it hits a fitting. There's friction loss, also known as pressure loss, okay, as it goes through the pipe. That's going to happen in any, pli any piping system. We have to be able to figure it out. I'm going to give you two ways. I'm going to give you the easy way, which will never undersize anything. This is beyond safe. And then I'm going to show you a more accurate method of, 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 sizing, of sizing head. So the easy way is simple. You measure the run as best you can. And we're going to measure the run. We're going to consider the run to be from the gazouta side of the circulator through the system all the way through the piping and then back into the gazinta side. That's the run, okay? That's the run, the total length of pipe. And in a retrofit or replacement application, you got to do the best you can, right? You're not going to be able to get in there with a ruler and, and a tape measure and measure every inch of pipe. You've got to do the best you can. And it could very well be, well, hey, I'm right here. I'm going up five feet and I'm going over 10 feet. That's 15 feet. Going down and include the element in this case, too. I'm going down 30 feet. So it's 10, 30. That's 40 feet. I'm going over 15 feet. That's 55. I'm coming back 40 feet. That's 95. I'm coming over 15. That's 110. I'm coming down 10. That's 120 feet. We'll call it 120 feet. That's pretty good. That's the least you should do, in my opinion. That gives us what we call the measured run. Next, we have to allow for valves and fittings and stuff that's in the way. Again, we can't get up there and count them, so we have to allow for them. And what we're going to do is we're going to multiply that measured run by 1.5. What we're doing is we're adding 50% to the length. All right, we're adding 50% to the length to allow for all those fittings. Because fittings have pressure drop that's equal to certain lengths of pipe. A three quarter inch copper elbow, for example, has the same pressure drop as two and a half feet of pipe. A 45 has the same pressure drop as one foot of pipe. Uh, a T has the same pressure drop as five foot of pipe, et cetera, et cetera. So we're gonna measure that run, multiply by 1.5, and that's gonna give us something called the total developed or total equivalent length. To estimate the head, you're gonna multiply that number by 0.04. Now, 0 0.04 represents four feet of head loss for every 100 feet of straight, properly sized pipe. So it's four feet of head for every 100 feet of straight, properly sized pipe. All right. Uh, it, math that out. That'll give you a high estimate of your head loss. Let, let's do one. OK, let's try this one. Let's say our total measured run is 140 feet. 140 feet from the Gazauta all the way through the Gazin to side, 140 feet. Do we worry about the boiler? Well, hey, you know what? If it's a cast iron boiler, I just generally consider that a length of pipe because the pressure loss through a cast iron boiler is way less than the pressure loss through a hunk of pipe of the same length. It, it's a big open space in the piping. You know, just don't worry about it. Things like, uh, like, like zone valves and stuff generally will be covered in the 1.5. Uh, an air separator. Less pressure drop through an air separator than through a, an equivalent length of pipe. So you've got things that you don't necessarily need to worry about for this particular type of sizing. So 140 feet to allow for the fittings, we're going to multiply by 1.5. So 140 times 1.5, that's a total developed or total equivalent length of 210 feet. Multiply 210 times 0 0.04, and you get eight and a half feet ahead. So our circulator is going to need to deliver three gallons a minute at about eight and a half feet ahead. If you want to simplify this and do it in one step, you can simply measure, uh, multiply 140 feet times 0 0.06. That'll come out to the same thing, but I didn't tell you that first because where does 0 0.06 come from? Well, if you multiply 1.5 times 0 0.04 or 0 0.04 times 1.5, you'll get 0 0.06, all right? So one step, two steps, your call. Just understand what each step represents. 1.5 is for the fittings. 0.4 represents four feet ahead for every 100 feet of straight, properly sized pipe.
Very good. All right. Check for questions, guys. How are we doing out there? Yeah, everybody good? Give me a little feedback. Are we happy? Are we following along? Is the pace good? Give me a little feedback in the question section and we'll keep moving on. 50% for fitting seems high. Yeah, it can. Like I said, this is pretty safe. I don't, you will never, Mike, you will never undersize a circulator this way. Ever, ever, ever. Uh, not even close. Um, so that's kind of that's kind of just the way 1.5 is used. And again, it'll and, take and, into account zone valves as well. And zone valves will, might have a particular CV that are be, be a little bit more than fitting. So we kind of keep that into perspective. Dave, I also look at that 50% of pipe that you put in there. Is you know if you've got pipe in the wall heading up to the second floor, does it jump over a stud cavity or not? We have no idea. Does it have two extra elbows in there? No idea. How many elbows are on a piece of baseboard? Sometimes two sometimes four so that's where that number you know we have to guess that otherwise we're busting open walls so that's yeah. just uh, you know the way i look at it if you're doing it you're not going to undersize anything you're going to make sure you've got enough circulator that would hit worst case scenario perfect alignment to the planets you know all that other stuff coming into play there so yes we know it's going to be high um, we can get closer other ways yes keyword here safe Keyword is safe. All righty, let's take a look now. What does that mean for a circulator? So we are looking at a circulator at three gallons a minute. So we look at the pump performance curve, three gallons a minute and about eight and a half feet ahead. So this right here is my requirement. Now, based on that, what circulator would you choose? Based on what you're looking at, what one of these 00 series circulators might you select? Throw, throw your answer in there. I'd be curious to see what you say. 007, sure, why not? What else? Anybody have a different thought on the matter? I can hear the people out there typing as we speak. Type away. It's, it's three numbers. <laughs> it's going to be a double O or the first two, and then it's something else. <laughs> well, if you take a really good look at the that that flow and head requirement it lands right on that purple line and that purple line is a different circulator that purple line is the 006b when you're selecting a circulator you really want to your your goal is to um find a circulator that the performance curve is either right on or slightly above slightly above your requirement well, the 006B looks like it's dead on, right? Well, yeah, you know what? The 006B would be a great selection here, Other, but that B part gets in the way. The B stands for bronze. This is a domestic hot water recirculation pump with a bronze body and sweat connections. It'll work and work fantastic here. The thing is, it's a, it's a, it's a bronze pump for domestic hot water. It's gonna be about at least twice the price of a 007. So in that case, Price kind of trumps applicability. And in this case, also, the 007 is really not a bad solution at all because we have to understand the concept of a system curve. We're doing an awful lot of math here to figure out, uh, excuse me, to figure out th three gallons a minute at eight and a half feet ahead. However, once we slap a circulator on here, the chances of this working, if we're not using the 006, the chances of this working at three gallons a minute at eight and a half feet ahead are, are zero. It'll never work there. It's going to work somewhere on the pump curve of the circulator you select. So say we select the 007, where would this circulator, where would the system actually operate? Here's a pop quiz for you, I'd like an answer. Uh, if I choose the 007, at what flow and at what head will the system actually operate? So again, there's a bunch of you out there. Type in your answer, just what you think. You don't have to be, it doesn't have to be right. It just has to be, you know, what do you think? All right. So where in terms of flow and head would this circular, would this system actually work if I were to put the 007 on this zone? All right. Let's see what you come up with there, folks. I'll wait. I have hot coffee. I can wait. Well, technically, I have warm coffee. <laughs> all right. No one wants to answer. Are you? Are you all? Are, are we all bored already? Hmm. All right. Well, let's let's try this. 
you, I've had people say, well, a and head, it has to work out here. It has to work at like, no, come on here. Let's go back here. It has to work at like, try that again. It has, to, no, it doesn't want to cooperate. All right. It has to work out here somewhere, like at, let's say seven gallons a minute. It has to work at seven gallons a minute. Well, no, that's not going to, it, the head isn't the limiting factor. We're looking at what we call the system curve. A system curve is going to look something like this. It's the cor mathematical correlation between flow and head. If you remember back to fifth or sixth grade math, you remember doing charts and graphs and having to do a bunch of math formulas to find these different points on a plot and then put them down there and you connect the dots and thinking to yourself back in fifth or sixth grade, this is BS. I'm never going to use this crap in the real world. This is a waste of my valuable time. Well, today's the day this is going to come back and haunt you. What we do is mathematically, we can put different points on the plot. We know three gallons a minute, the head's at eight foot ahead. Mathematically, we can figure out the head at two gallons a minute, at one gallon a minute, four gallons a minute, at five gallons a minute. We can do all of that. What we're going to come up with is a, is a curve that looks kind of like that. It shoots up sort of kind of like a rocket ship. As flow goes up, head goes up algorithmically. It just, you know, it's a, it's a function of the square of the increase. So in reality, I won't have three gallons a minute at eight and a half feet ahead. If I put this 007 on here, I might be three and a quarter gallons a minute at maybe nine and a half feet ahead. That's not horrible. That's really not horrible. That's a well-sized circulator. I'm still over pumping three and a half gallons a minute when I only need three, but I'm covered. It's going to work. It's going to work and it's going to work just fine in terms of keeping people from freezing to death. Now, what if I go with a three-speed circulator? Let's pay attention to the 0015 here, because that's kind of the industry standard three-speed pump curves. Um, the 0015 from us, the Grundfos 1558, the BNG NRF 22, all kind of have the same basic pump performance curves. You can throw a blanket over all of them. If we were to look at three gallons a minute at eight feet ahead, we're right here. Well, now we have to pick which blue line are we going to select? Are we going to select low, medium, or high? Well, again, from the looks of things, medium should be just fine, right? But again, we know what's going to happen is we're going to set it to high because 30,000 BTUs, 140 feet, if we're not doing any math, that's a big honking zone. We think, oh my God, I better make sure I have enough flow. Well, if we were to set it to high and we were to extrapolate out our system curve, now all of a sudden we might be out here at four gallons a minute instead of three. Well, that doesn't sound horrible, does it? four gallons a minute instead of three, you know, I'm fine. I'm going to heat the house, but that is also 33% more flow. I want to suggest to you something. Three GPM equals 30,000 BTUs divided by 20 degree delta T times 500. Well, that's all well and good, but I'm not giving it three gallons a minute. I'm giving it four. This doesn't change. I only need 30,000 BTUs under design condition. That's not going to change. And boy, if I put more flow, I'll get more heat. Well, I don't need any more heat, so that's kind of silly. What's going to give, man? There's something has to give here to make this balance. The thing that's going to give is the delta T. A 33% increase in flow is going to result in a 25% drop in delta T. So my best delta T, the best differential between the supply and return is going to be 15 degrees and not 20. So water's going out at 180, coming back not at 160, but at 165. What's that going to do to the boiler? I'll give you a hint. It's short cycling. Okay, we're going to short cycle the boiler. We're going to force that boiler to short cycle more than it wants to already on the day where its cycle should be the longest. And here's the kicker. As it gets warmer, this situation gets worse. Let's say I'm at 50% load. That's 15,000 BTUs. Now my delta T is in 15, my delta T is seven and a half degrees, and that boiler's going to short cycle some more. All right, and listen, and write this one down, gang. We will spend 50% of a typical heating season, 50% of a typical heating season at one third load or less. So 50% of a typical heating season, we're going to have a delta T less than five degrees. All right because I'm still pumping away at four gallons a minute. Now, do you understand why we're talking about oversizing pumps? No one's ever gonna freeze to death here. And if that's all you care about, well, that's fine. But there's a price to be paid here. There's a price to be paid for over pumping and that comes in overall system efficiency, all right? So that's the math behind this. That's how this actually does work. 
uh, if you want to know how to how to uh, calculate out or plot out a system curve, you don't have to do much math. You just need a BNG system sizer wheel and use scale number five. All right. So we came up with three gallons a minute. The white window on scale five is GPM, and we set that to eight and a half feet ahead. Now to figure out the head at different flow rates, you simply go up or down. So at two gallons a minute, I'm at just about four feet ahead. I go over here to one gallon a minute, I'm something less. At four gallons a minute, I'm a little over 15 feet ahead. Five gallons a minute, I'm at 24 feet ahead. That's how you come up with those points on the plot. And you'll be able to, to draw out your system curve and you'll be able to see where the system curve intersects the pump curve. Short, the short story of all this is the more white space on a pump curve, let's go back here, the more white space on a pump curve between your requirement and the curve, the more you're gonna oversize that circulator and the more this scenario comes back to haunt you, okay? So you wanna keep that curve as close to the requirement as possible. Now, here's the thing. I'm gonna tell you that low speed would be fine. That low speed's gonna be more than enough because what we're gonna do here is we're actually gonna figure out flow the right way, all right? Oh, I'm sorry, figuring out, if, uh, I'll figure out head the right way. At three gallons a minute, what will happen is if we math this out properly, we'll be down at around four feet ahead. In reality, with we at the actual flow rate that we have, if we mapped it out rather than estimating, we'd actually be down around here, and I would tell you that low speed would be perfectly fine. All right, perfectly fine. If we were to look at a variable speed circulator, a lot of people think, well, throw a variable speed circulator, I'll fix everything, ha, ha, ha. Not necessarily. These things are not magic. These things don't do the thinking for you. These things do not take the thinking out of it. They are very specific in what they can do, uh, as long as you know. Uh, this is the 0015 E3. It's a three setting variable speed ECM circulator with constant pressure. I can set it at five foot ahead, I could set it at 10 foot ahead, or I could set it at high, which is gonna be full speed, fixed speed. All right, that's contractor no callback mode. If I had three gallons a minute at eight feet ahead right here, well, okay, I could set that to medium speed and it's gonna be terrific. It's gonna work maybe right around here. Again, maybe at about three and a half GPM, but it's gonna be at about, I'd say 30 watts instead of 80 watts of a 007. It's not going to be a variable speed circulator. It's going to work right there all the time because it's, a, it's as a zone pump, there's nothing to make this thing change its speed. It's going to come on, run that speed, shut off. That's it. Not bad, but it's also going to be um, it's going to be at about it's going to be at um, that that one particular speed. If I was at th if in, if I really mathed it out, three gallons a minute at four feet ahead, and I picked low speed. I'm in an even better position where maybe I'm working at about 18 watts. All right, so I'm starting to make an electrical consumption difference. The difference is basically going to be, you know what? I'm not going to save the customer oodles of money, but the way this is going to work is they're going to buy this circulator anyway. It's just a matter of whether you give it to them or not. They're going to own, they're going to pay for this circulator in about two years. The electrical savings will pay for the circulator in about two years. It's, and they're gonna pay that anyway. It's just a matter of whether you give them the circulator or not. So it's just the way it is. So again, in a zone pump situation, variable speed circulators, delta P variable speed circulators don't vary their speed. Delta T circulators will, as we shall see in a bit. Here's that right way I wanted to show you real quick. And, and both of this, the, the, these sizing things apply to both circulators and to zone valves, by the way. But here's the right way to do to, to size to, to calculate head. This chart comes from the Copper Development Association's Copper Tube Handbook. You can find it on their website, download it. It's about 180 pages of mind-numbingly boring nonsense that's saved by table six in the back of the book. It's pressure loss of water due to friction in types K, L, and M copper. It gives you uh, it gives you the pressure loss in psi per foot of tube. All right. You get it in PSI per foot of tube right here. And it breaks it down not only by pipe size and type, but also by flow rate, all right? The, 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 the easy method just figured the maximum flow for each size of pipe. So for three quarter inch, that'd be four feet, four gallons a minute. For one inch, it would be nine gallons a minute. It figures the head at the maximum flow rate. This gives us the ability to target the specific flow rate. Our flow rate was three gallons a minute for that one zone, and we were using three quarter inch type M copper. We follow the row and column to where they intersect, 
and the pressure loss in PSI for one foot of pipe is 0 0.009. So let's multiply the total developed length, 210 feet times 0 0.009 PSI per foot, that's 1.9 PSI. How do we convert PSI into feet ahead? We multiply it by 2.31. Why 2.31? A column of water 2.31 feet high will have a gauge pressure at the bottom of 1 PSI. So 1 PSI in our world, 1 PSI of pressure drop is equal to 2.31 feet ahead. That's just the way it is. So 1.9 PSI times 2.31 feet of head per PSI. Now we're back to that 4.5 feet ahead that I was talking about earlier. So in reality, we only need that. Three gallons a minute at 4.5 feet ahead. That's all we need. We go back here. Now you're starting to see what's going on. If I were to use a 007, maybe I'd be at about four gallons a minute. If I went with a 008, a bigger pump, I might be at five gallons a minute, all right? Again, let's calculate, if we were to calculate this out, three gallons a minute at four and a half feet ahead, four gallons at eight, five gallons at about 12 and a half, six gallons at 18, all right? If we were to look at, figure out the, the system curve that way, and let's apply it to our three speed circulators, all right? We connect these dots, and if I go to that contractor no callback mode again, I'm way up here at almost five, four and a half feet. Uh, no, 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 that's, oh, that's about five and a half gallons a minute, right? That's about, looks like at about five and a half gallons a minute. Again, what does that do to the delta T? Shrinks the delta T and, and short cycles the boiler. This is reality, gang. To me, this is, I don't know about you, but to me, this is advanced hydronics. This is how things really work, all right? This is how things really work. And, you know, understanding this is, is kind of the factor in determining how efficient your system, efficiently your systems are going to operate. Uh, the circulator has more to say about system efficiency than we've ever given it credit for. And, and, and that's one thing variable speed circulators have opened our eyes about, because now we can actually get the flow get the circulator's performance closer to the actual requirements if we know what they're doing, because they don't do it on their own. If we know what we're doing, we can get the circulator to work closer to where we need it to, and that will enhance the overall efficiency of the system. Because system efficiency is a combination. You've got combustion efficiency, you've got how well the boiler operates, how well it's utilizing and delivering the BTUs it's making, and the circulator has a lot to say about that. All righty. Um, Again, if we were to go here, three and a half gallons a minute at four feet, at, three gallons a minute at four and a half feet ahead, low speed's going to be plenty. All right, we're maybe working at 15, 16 watts. Gosh, that's perfect. That's terrific. All righty, let's talk about zone valves real quick and sizing circulators for zone valves. Why do we zone with zone valves? Well, again, why not, right? Why not? Circulate, or zone valves are pretty doggone reliable, all right? The wiring and the maintenance is a lot easier. It's low voltage wiring. You wanna pop off a zone valve head. It takes about two seconds with these zone sentries uh, if you dawdle, okay? So service, maintenance, wiring, a heck of a lot easier, a heck of a lot easier. Take up a lot less space too. Again, you don't need as much room to work. So one circulator and five zone valves takes up a lot less space than five circulators. And Let's face it, today we don't have that whole wall of the basement that we're given to, to create our hydronics masterpiece. More and more we're tasked with putting five pounds of hydronic you-know-what into a 10-pound closet, or the other way around. 10 pounds of hydronic you-know-what into a five-pound closet, right? So it, it's it, space can be at a premium. And if you're counting watts, all right, if you're counting overall energy consumption, well, duh, so zone valves use a lot less electrical energy than circulators i mean by how much well it's simple five circuit five one zone valve and i'm try that again one circulator and five zone valves uses about 80 percent less electricity than five circulators you want to know the magic math behind that goes back to first grade one circulator is 80 percent fewer circulators than five circulators all right I, if it, and, and here's the thing, more often than not, it's the same circulator. You'd be amazed what you can do with a 007 or equivalent uh, in a zone valve application. You don't need a bigger circulator just because it's one circulator doing all that work. Uh, it's, it's, you just gotta know how to figure out flow and head for zone valves. But you can have much lower overall energy consumption if that is of concern, all right? So again, yeah, well, here's three, just for an example, if you say say your, your cost per kilowatt hour is about 15 cents, all right? Three 007s in an average heating season 
that's going to cost you about 90 bucks, 30 bucks a circulator. All right, three 007s might cost 90 bucks for the heating season. One 007 and three zone sentry zone valves, that's about 32 bucks. All right, you're not going to get rich off the difference, but hey, you know, 48 bucks is 48 bucks, right? So, or 50, is it 58? 58 bucks. 58 bucks is 58 bucks, right? Go crazy, but that's kind of the way it is. All right, that's just this, the diff, that's just math at that point. All righty. So yeah, you don't have the redundancy. So if a pump fails, there's no heat. All right? I get that. That's always a concern. But two things. Number one, circulators are pretty doggone reliable. And if you're looking at like the, the Takeo um, uh, 00 series, uh, E-series circulators, the ECM circulators, they are equipped with what we call shore start and, and an automatic air purge. So they, they'll take care of both of those. If you ever have a, a, if you ever get a circulator that has like a locked rotor, all right, the 00 series uh, ECM circulators have shore start, it'll shake itself free. It does what it can to shake itself free if you're, if you're ever in a locked rotor situation. So that eliminates a service call. If you ever have an air, are in an airbound situation where the volute is airbound, the circulator will cut, try to purge itself of that air and again, reduce a service call. So or eliminate a service call. So you have those kinds of things to look at. So yeah, so you, and, and either way, if you do have an issue, you're going back, whether it's a zone pump or a zone valve issue, you know, zone pump issue or a zone valve pump issue, you're still going back either way. So uh, you balance those out, you balance those out. Sizing circulators for zone valves. Now, with when we size the circulator for zone pumps, each pump is obviously sized for the flow and head of the zone that it's served. In this case, we have one pump for the entire job, so that circulator has to deliver the flow for the entire job, for the entire house, all right? So we add all the zones together for the total heat load of the structure. When it comes to head, we don't have to add the head of each individual zone together and then size the pump for the total head. We only have to size the circulator for the head loss of the worst case zone only. And that's because we're dealing with a parallel piping system. In a parallel piping system, if my circulator can overcome the head loss of the worst case zone, it can certainly overcome the head loss of the other zones. Because understand this, the water doesn't have to go through this zone, then this zone, and then this zone, and then come back. Some water goes through this zone, some water goes through that zone, and some water goes through the other zone. So if I can overcome the worst case head loss zone, I can overcome all the others. Let me know if that makes sense to you, because it really frees us up when it comes to circulator sizing. It makes it a lot easier. So if we can overcome the head, head loss through the worst case zone, we can overcome the head loss through all of the others. All righty then, and that is why. So let's take a look. Let's say my total heating load is 75,000 BTUs. I got three zones, they total up to 75,000 BTUs, and I'm designing to a 20 degree delta T. The required flow rate in this case, I'll throw it out to you guys. 75,000 divided by 20 times 500, Write your answer in. What do we got for a required flow rate for the entire job? Seven and a half GPM, says Mike Lampkin. You are absolutely correct. Seven and a half GPM, 75,000 divided by 20 times 500 or 10,000. That's 7.5 GPM, 7.5 gallons per minute. So we're in good shape there. We only need seven and a half GPM for the entire job. Now all we got to do is figure out the head loss for the worst case zone. So in this case, we're going to measure the longest run. And again, that's going to be from the Gazauda side of the circulator all the way through the zone back to the Gazinda side of the circulator. So let's figure out that length, okay? And we've already done that before. Well, let's say our biggest zone in this case is 30,000 BTUs. That's three gallons per minute, like we just did. It's, it's the exact same zone we just did. It's 140 foot long, total equivalent length. We came up with 210 feet. We go back here, we do the same math all over again, we find that it's four and, a half, four and a half feet ahead. That's the worst case zone. So now dig this, the circulator only has to give us seven and a half gallons per minute at four and a half feet ahead, all right? It's amazing when you do the math of these things, how low the head loss really is, all right? So these high head pumps really uh, cause us more problems than they solve. In virtually every case, they, they create more problems than they solve. 
if we were to do this, uh, go look again, look at our system size or wheel, we got seven and a half gallons a minute at four and a half feet ahead. So six gallons a minute, we're three feet ahead, five gallons a minute, we're two feet ahead. Okay, four gallons a minute, we're a little over one foot ahead. And then we go the other direction. Okay, we go to eight gallons a minute, we're a little over five, nine, we're six and a half. 10 gallons a minute, we're at eight feet ahead. So we've got a bunch of points on the plot here. Let's plot them out on our three-speed circulator and you'll see what we have. If I were to use a three-speed circulator, okay, low speed, we really did the math. So low speed's kind of out of the equation. Again, we're focusing on the 0015 here. Low speed's out of the equation. I could select medium speed, but again, we know what happens out there in the real world. What in the real world, what's going to happen is most guys are going to select high speed. So what we have in terms of flow, if I select medium speed as opposed to low medium speed, I'm going to be pumping at a rate of about 10. Okay, right at about. Uh, oops, let's go back here. I'm going to be pumping at a rate of about 10. Excuse me, 10 gallons per minute. All right, I'm going to be pumping it at about 10 gallons per minute, right about here. If I go to high speed, I'm going to be pumping at a rate of about 11 gallons per minute, at 11 gallons per minute. So again, we go back to our GPM equals BTUH divided by delta T times 500. I've got two problems here. First off, my incredible shrinking delta T, whoop, is is getting even smaller here because that's under design conditions. The rest of the year gets smaller, smaller, smaller. But now let's look at what happens when zone valves close. I'm going to be going up. You know, I'm going to have different system curves for different combinations of zones that are open at any given point in time. With a three zone zone valve system, I actually have seven different system curves because that's how many combinations I have. Let's count them out. I've got zone one by itself, zone two by itself, zone three by itself, zone one and two, zones one and three, zones two and three, and zones one, two and three. So I'm going to have seven different system curves here and seven different points of intersection. As flow goes down, head goes up. A steep curve pump like your standard three-speed circulator, the 0015, the 1558, the NRF22, is just by its very nature completely ill-suited for zone valve jobs. Because as zones close, I'm closing against higher and higher and higher pressure differentials, and that's what's going to cause zone valves to bang when they close. It gets like a water hammer noise and that causes zone valves to bang. They're not supposed to bang, all right? They're not supposed to do that. Just as an example, let's say I chose uh, one of the, the, the 0010 three speed, which is a replacement from B&G 100s. Uh, Price-wise, it's not gonna fit, but just use that as an example. These are flatter curve pumps. If I were to choose, let's say medium speed here, I'm going to intersect here, 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 and here. Just think, see that different pressure differential, all right? And all of a sudden, the banging's gone away. We're not creating banging because we're not putting a circulator in that's going to cause banging. A lot of folks say, well, why don't you just put in a pressure differential bypass valve? And to me, that makes no sense whatsoever. Yes, it solves the problem, okay? But what does a pressure differential bypass valve do? It's very simple. A pressure differential bypass valve in a zone valve application turns a steep curve pump into a flat curve pump. Well, by, take, by, by giving that excess pressure someplace to bypass too. Well, if that's the case, why on earth do that? Why not put in a flat curve pump in the first place? Why would you put a band, why, you know, th th to me, that's putting a Band-Aid on a self-inflicted wound. It makes zero sense. Use the right pump for the job. Zone, valve, zone valves and flat curve pumps like the 007, go together like cake and ice cream. Zone valves and steep curve pumps like the 0015, like the 1558, like the NRF22, go together like ice cream and tuna fish. That means not at all, all right? So I, I, it, it boggles my mind that somewhere along the line, we, we figured that putting a pressure differential bypass valve on a zone valve job, uh, because that's the only way to eliminate zone valves from banging was the right thing to do. Well, no, it's a Band-Aid for a self-inflicted wound. It's the price you have to pay for insisting on using the wrong pump for the application. Uh, it's just kind of the way of looking at it in, from, from my perspective anyway. So one of the things that variable speed circulators have been touted 
to do is to, to, to alleviate the need for the pressure differential bypass valve. Well, so does using a flat curve pump like a 007. That would make that go away. Uh, but it's not automatic. You still have to pick the right performance. So again, if I were to pick the 0015E3 and set it to high, I have not taken care of the banging zone valve problem. It just It's not going to change anything because I'm going to be working on that pump curve. I'm still going to have banging zone valves. I'm still going to over pump. The only thing I'm getting out of this is I'm using half the electricity as I would otherwise. Well, big whoop. I'm missing the whole opportunity here. If I get closer and closer to proper sizing, then I'm going to get better and better at it. So if I set, I know, seven and a half gallons a minute, four and a half feet ahead. If I set this sucker to low where it should be, all right, here's my intersection point. And if I keep looking at this, I'm constantly intersecting at that five foot ahead line. So I have no issues whatsoever with zone valve banging. I'm going to be closer to the real flow and head requirements with each for each combination of zones calling at any given point in time. So I'm going to keep that delta T as wide as I can for as long as I can. It's not always going to be 20. In fact, it's never going to be 20, but it's going to be better than it would have been. And I'm using the absolute bare minimum amount of electricity possible. I'm going to be anywhere from maybe 25, 30 watts down to maybe seven or eight watts, depending upon what zones are calling. So in every in every instance, this is a better application than a fixed speed pump, especially a three speed pump sent the contractor no callback mode. Um, it, it eliminates banging, it uses less electricity, but most importantly, it keeps that incredible shrinking delta T from shrinking too much. And it helps enhance the efficiency overall of the system. So I don't know if this has been helpful to you or not. I hope it has. Um, and we can also go ahead and look at the smallest zone as well. Uh, the 120 feet, uh, let's say it's it's only a, a small zone, one gallon a minute, three quarter inch pipe. I've got next to nothing here uh, in terms of, uh, I'm sorry, in terms of uh, two gallons a minute. It's not one gallon, it's two gallons a minute, 20,000 BTU. So I'm right here, 0 0.004 uh, PSI per foot of pipe. If I calculate that out, that's 1.1 1 .1 feet ahead, so two gallons a minute at 1.1 feet ahead. First off, think if I had put a circulator on that zone by itself. This is the same job. If I put a circulator in that zone by itself, two gallons a minute one foot ahead, there's no way. There's no way I'm going to find a pump that'll do that. All right, that's impossible. I'm going to not only going to over pump that zone, I'm going to wicked over pump that zone, and my delta T is going to be insane, uh, insanely low all year long. Um, in a zone valve application, again, if I go, now again, we can go back and, and calculate that out. But in a zone valve application, I'm down here at two gallons a minute, that are two gallons a minute at 1.1 feet ahead. I'm kind of right around there. You know, tell me what you're going to use. All right. You got to go with zone valves at that point. You got to. All righty. How are we doing on questions? Dave, if you're still there, uh, where are we at for questions? No, Dave had to bug out. No, Dave's still with us. Uh, no, I'm sorry, guys, yeah. guys it's, ask your questions. Let, let me know if this has been useful to you um, uh, and if this helped answer some of your questions. I guess, again, the answer, the ultimate answer, zone valves or circulators is going to be what, you know, is going to be what works best for you. Um, there's no difference in terms of delivering BTUs. You're never going to figure out, you're never going to notice a difference in delivery. Uh, but choosing the right circulator for zone valves and choosing the right circulator for zone pumping is really what's going to make the difference. Uh, you, it's as you can see, oversizing is really easy to do. It's because re because nobody two gallons a minute, one foot ahead, nobody makes a pump that's going to be too low. We make a pump that'll get you close. All right, our 0018E, we make a pump that'll get you close to that, as close as can as it can be gotten to. Does that make sense? Yeah, I guess that's the right phraseology. Um, we can get it as close to, we can get as close as we can to that. But, you know, again, most normal pumps out there, oversized, they're going to be too big. It's just a matter of knowing what you're doing and understanding the math behind it. We may make, we may be stuck with a pump that's going to be too big, but we're, we can make the right decision. So we're not stuck with a pump that's too, too big or stuck with a pump that's going to create other problems that we have to solve like the incredible shrinking delta T or like banging zone valves. And banging zone valves 
aren't a problem. It's not because the circulator is no good. It's not because the zone valves are no good. It's because we have a bad marriage. It's the wrong circulator for that application. Flat curve pumps are perfectly ideal and perfectly mated for zone valve applications. Uh, whether you're talking about a delta P pump or a delta T pump, both are going to be perfectly suited for zone valve applications as well and for zone pumping applications. Again, as long as you know how to set them up properly. There's no such thing as push a button and it'll figure it all out for, it'll figure it all out by itself. That's a fairy tale that's long been disproven. Um, you still got to know what you're doing and you know the, the I think the worst thing we ever did was call these things smart pumps. I love them. They're fantastic pieces of equipment, but they don't do the thinking for you and they don't take the thinking out of it. They do require you to know what you're holding in your hand and what it does. Calling it a smart pump is maybe the worst thing because they ain't that smart. They still need you to drive the bus. And that's why professionals know. That's that's the difference between a professional and an amateur. So, all righty, folks. I do appreciate the gift of your time. And again, we'll stay on for as long as you guys have questions. Right now, the, it looks like the discussion is turning to baseball <laughs> on the on the questions chart. But uh, <laughs> um, sports are weird right now, aren't they? It's kind of hard to take them. I, 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 uh, you know, the Red Sox stink this year, but I find it hard to be, be upset about it because it's a 60-game season. To me, it doesn't really count. You know, and I think I don't know about you, but a fundamental change in attitude about sports in general with all this is all right, I can live without it. Now, football season's going to start and, you know, sports might not be a life and death situation, but the Patriots certainly are. And this is going to be an interesting season. So, well, that's going to be the acid test. Do I still get does my blood pressure still go up when the Patriots play and do I still get angry when they lose? That's going to be a question. So we'll see how that works out. But anyway, folks, um, any more questions out there regarding the subject matter or anything TACO or hydronics related? Dave and I are here to uh, whatever you whatever you, questions you might have. Jackie, it was a pleasure to see you, too. Thank you for being here. I miss you. I cannot wait to at least see you again and see other people again down at that fa down at our factory. <laughs> it's been weird. I was talking to Dave earlier uh, before we started that. I, the biggest thing, the biggest effect all of this has had on me working from home. All right. Now, you, you guys, I guess it's got to get out there and working. You're still out there in your vans and you're out working and seeing people and doing stuff. You know, doing what I do, I sit in my office and I work and I don't see people. The biggest effect it's had on me personally is I know what today is, but I don't know what tomorrow is. So I'm all of a sudden, I got three in the afternoon and go, oh, I have, I have a webinar tomorrow and I don't have anything prepared. I better get ready. You know, so. Uh, it's it it's it, it teaches you very good skills on how to uh, on how to hit curveballs, but it's it's kind of disconcerting when you all of a sudden wake up in the middle of the night because oh no it's it, it was like when back you were in school and you woke up on a Wednesday morning <laughs> and it was the day the science fair projects were due and you had all semester to work on it and you did nothing <laughs> it's that same feeling all right it's that same feeling <laughs> how are you doing out there Dave? For me, that was uh, walking on the bus and everybody else had theirs done. And I'm like, that's today? Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And most of them, their parents did it for them anyway. So, you know. Yeah. 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 All righty mm -hmm. then, folks. Thank you again. It's, it was a pleasure being here. Uh, and uh, I hope all of you did. And for those of you who are left, I hope all of you did get the notice that our own Dave Holdorf was named by OESP as Trainer of the Year. And I wanna give you, my friend, a round of applause and the Thank highest you. of high fives for that well-deserved honor. I could not be more proud of you. That is just fantastic. Thanks, man. Thank you. It was uh, it was a crazy surprise and, and not expected whatsoever. So mm -hmm. it's, uh, yeah. Again, one of those times when it makes you speechless. You know, it's hard to say words behind it. You know, when you get yeah. So. And I know you being speechless is not easy for you. That's a that's a <laughs> that's a heck of a, a heck of a shock then. It must have been. But uh uh I can't think of anybody more deserving and I could not be proud I could not be more proud of you. That is just so so very awesome and uh and very well deserved. And we're lucky to have you on our team and uh, you guys out there you you guys out there in the East Coast, very, very lucky to have Dave as your trainer because he is one of the very, very best. Well, technically, according to OSP, he is the very best. <laughs> so <laughs> I will, and I will happily go along with that assessment. So, all righty, folks. Hey, thank you all again. Um, 
do appreciate it. And um, any questions, of course, you will be getting a follow-up email uh, with uh, a link to the recording of this session, so you can watch it again as uh, as as many times as you like. And any questions would pop up, please shoot Dave an email or myself an email, and we are more than happy to help you. In fact, any kind of human contact for me right now is a good thing. <laughs> so, and uh, next week is another class uh, that oh, we yes. have next next Thursday. Yep, yep, and and we'll be diving into the ECM uh, myths and truths. So again, John and I will be hosting that class. Again, thanks to Eastern Energy Expo for still trying to keep some normalcy when it comes to the world of trade shows. Um, visit the booths, the virtual booths that are there. Uh, set up appointments if you need to talk to anybody because you'll get the best of the best people um, based on your question or what you have. So uh, that information will be sent to either the product manager or some of the tech support guys or myself or John. Um, so do that also uh, through Eastern Energy Expo's website, and uh, and we'll look forward to seeing you next Tuesday, same bat time, same bat channel. And don't forget, if you can, if you see it on uh, Facebook or anything, sign up for Takeo After Dark Summer School. Our final session is tomorrow night, and we have some special guests lined up that can uh, for a nice little roundtable. It'll be an interesting session, so uh, make sure you join us for Takeo After Dark tomorrow night. So take care, everybody. Excellent. We'll see you next week or tomorrow night, hopefully. See ya.